Hello. Thank you for tuning in today for this very important discussion highlighting improvements to health care as a result of reforms that are part of the new health care law, the Affordable Care Act. I'm Janice Cheney, State Director for AARP in North Dakota. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization focused on issues that support people 50 and over and their families in living their best lives. We carefully consider positions on issues important to our members, their families, and society as a whole. These decisions are made by our National Volunteer Board after intensive research and review that includes surveys of members and the public. We are committed to providing our members and the public with accurate and up-to-date information on the Affordable Care Act. There has been a great deal of misinformation and misunderstanding around this important legislation. It is imperative that we all work to understand what it does and how it will help millions of Americans and thousands of North Dakotans live better, healthier, more productive lives. AARP has and continues to support the Affordable Care Act for a number of reasons, especially because it strengthens Medicare, and because it guarantees access to affordable health insurance coverage for Americans between the ages of 50 and 64. There are other benefits that will strengthen our health care generally and begin the process of controlling costs for all of us. I'm joined today by individuals who have worked extensively on these issues and who bring important perspectives and understanding to aspects of this landmark legislation. They are Marguerite Salazar, Regional Director for Region 8 of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Siri Fiebiger, a physician practicing here in North Dakota, and Paul Ronigan, North Dakota State Coordinator for the Children's Defense Fund. Welcome and thanks to all of you for being here. Marguerite, you've been a part of the process of as this legislation has developed and, and begun to be implemented, perhaps you could start us off with an overview of some of the important aspects of the new health care law. Yes, Janice, thank you again for having me here. What a great opportunity to talk about the new health care law or the Affordable Care Act. First of all, a lot of people wonder, why did we have to have a new, new health care law? Why is reform so important? And the main reason was that health insurance while it was available to a lot of big companies and, and, and large organizations, it often wasn't available for small businesses or individuals. And even those people who did have insurance often were hit with lifetime limits. Those things right now, because of the Affordable Care Act, are completely gone. That's part of the patient bill of rights that comes with the Affordable Care Act. Another thing is that children with the, through the Patient Bill of Rights no longer can be denied care because of a pre-existing condition. The Affordable Care Act offers a lot of preventive services and we know that the earlier you uh, identify a problem and start uh, treating that problem, your uh, chances of surviving that issue are a lot better and the cost is a lot uh, lower at that time as well. And so the Affordable Care Act provides for preventive services for people with insurance at no out-of-pocket cost. We also know that small businesses now um, who have had a hard time uh, finding insurance and affording it for their, for their employees are going to be able to receive tax credits when they do purchase insurance for their employees. People who are looking for information can go to irs.gov. Great. Thank you, Marguerite. You've touched on a number of important aspects, including the fact that the um, health care law will make insurance more accessible and affordable for families. You've touched on the small business aspect. Could you talk just a little bit about some of the highlights for Medicare beneficiaries in particular? Oh, thank you. Yes, that, that is a big one because so many people have been worried about what's going on with Medicare, and I want to reassure folks that Medicare is stronger than ever. Again, we have um, starting in 2011, one of the provisions talks about the donut hole, and, and that's for people who have Medicare Part D, the prescription benefit. Now, in the past, when people would hit that threshold, they would have to pay a uh, full cost. Starting in 2011, people who hit that threshold get a 50% discount on name brand drugs. That donut hole will go completely away by 2020. 
Excellent. That's great information. Talk, and, and just to highlight one more piece of what you were talking about, the, um, the impact on small businesses. Um, I think there's been a lot of con discussion and, and um, uh, information that, that may not be entirely accurate in that context. Could you talk a, just a little bit more about the highlights for small businesses and how they'll be impacted by sure. the law? Well, one of the things is that we know that when small business would try to buy the same insurance plan that a large company would buy, they on average had to pay 18% more. So what we're trying to do is uh, offer these tax credits to small businesses for businesses with fewer than 25 employees are able to get a tax credit. Now this tax credit is available to them uh, starting in 2010. So so if businesses didn't realize that they could get that tax credit, they can actually go back and amend their tax forms and get that credit for themselves. The other thing is that businesses with fewer than 50 people are not required to buy insurance. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Marguerite. Dr. Fiebiger, from your perspective as a physician, could you tell us a little bit about um, how the, ACE, the Affordable Care Act improves care and helps doctors see patients and work with them to remain healthy. I'd l thank you, Janice. I'd like to. First, I want to thank AARP for inviting me to be a part of this very, very important conversation. Uh, as a provider of women's health care for over the past 25 years, I've come to understand that health care is best delivered as a human right and not a privilege. We providers do our best work when you, our patients can easily see us, when we can listen generously, uh, when we have time to answer your questions and work with you and our team to help keep you healthy, utilizing those expensive resources only when absolutely necessary. My patient Rachel wants me to share her story. She was 30 and due for her annual PAP when her job and, and her insurance were outsourced. She got her PAP anyway and also found a new job. However, her new insurance would not cover her pre-existing precancerous changes that were found on her pap smear. So she didn't follow up with me for over a year. When she did return, we found stage three cervical cancer and she's been fighting for her life for the past two years. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 50 million Americans were uninsured in 2010 and we lose 45,000 people every year to the lack of insurance. The Affordable Care Act expands coverage in two very, very important ways because it provides insurance for those without, young adults who've not had insurance uh, and can stay on the parents' insurance until they're 26, those with pre-existing conditions eventually, the elimination of lifetime caps and eliminating the higher cost for women as well as expanding all coverage to inc include preventative care, including contraceptive services, all without cost sharing. Both of these expansions mean that patients can come see me. The Affordable Care Act also ensures that we get more value for our health care dollar. We currently pay more than twice what anybody else does in the world for our health care, and yet we rank 39th in the world in terms of our health status. We rank 50th in longevity. Now, as the ACA requires that 80 percent of each premium dollar is spent on health care, we should get better value from our insurance. The Affordable Care Act also supports improving the quality of the care we provide. And this is done through accountable care organizations, where providers such as myself must meet guidelines for, pro for providing preventive and chronic care to Medicare patients. And will be rewarded for keeping patients healthier at an overall cost savings. And that really does make a lot of sense to think about our system in terms of keeping people healthier rather than um, the more expensive avenue of treating them once they get sick. Paul, we've heard about some of the important benefits of the Affordable Care Act, and I know your emphasis is on, on, on children and, and the, ch the needs of children in our society, which is just critical to a healthy future for all of us. Could you talk a little bit about some of the benefits um, as far as kids are concerned? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, Janice, I'd like to thank you and AARP for convening this conversation regarding the Affordable Care Act. There are significant benefits for children and families from the Affordable Care Act, and I'd like to point those out. 
First of all, insurers are no longer able to deny children insurance due to pre-existing conditions. It stops insurance companies from canceling insurance when a person becomes sick. Young adults up to age 26, like my son and his wife, are able to stay on their parents' uh, health insurance. And since the Affordable Care Act has been passed, over 5,000 North Dakotans are taking advantage of being on their parents' health insurance. It requires states to extend Medicaid coverage to young adults up to age 26 who are in foster care at their 18th birthday or older. It also establishes a benefit package for well child visits, which will be covered both in the public and private sector. Regardless of what insurance package you may qualify for, there will be one person who can enroll you and other families, uh, other family members in the appropriate health care plan. This is sometimes noted as the no wrong door policy. It also maintains the Children's Health Insurance Program through 2019 and it establishes a home visiting program to young at-risk children and their families. It should be noted that children without health insurance are 10 times more likely to have unmet medical needs, are five times more likely to have unmet dental needs, and are impacted in their educational performance and miss more days of school. Thanks, Paul. It's really important that we keep in mind the perspective of this legislation and what it will do for people across the age, um, across the range of, range of ages in our country. <clears throat> Marguerite, in your opening comments, you, you talked a little bit about Medicare and some of the uh, preventive benefits and the impact on prescription drug costs. And I wonder if we could uh, touch on those again, just as kind of a highlight or reminder, and also touch on the issues of fraud and abuse that I know are of concern to a lot of folks. Of course. Well, again, when we, when we look at how we're going to stay healthy, and I think that's everybody's goal, we need to, to remember that having that flu shot every year is really important. And, and having mammograms and colonoscopies at certain times in your life. And the problem was that a lot of people just felt they couldn't afford that out-of-pocket copayment that came with that. And so now the wisdom shows us that if we can offer that to folks with no out-of-pocket expense, they're more likely to get that. And again, be able to have those bone scans and all the immunizations that they may need. And again, this is something that you would discuss with your doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so along with that, one of the new provisions is a well an annual wellness check. It's not a physical, but it's again, the wellness check has no out-of-pocket expense. And you sit down with your provider and map out what you need for the year. So that doctor is going to help you decide what kind of measures you need to take in terms of prevention. And we know that there's not enough money in the world to take care of all of the chronic disease that we develop if we don't take those preventive measures. Mm -hmm. So then people ask, well, how are we going to pay for all of this? All of these things are, are coming forth and, and it surely must attach a cost. Well, first of all, we know that prevention is a lot less expensive than treatment. But on the other hand, we also know that over the past many years, there has been a lot of fraud and abuse in Medicare especially. And so starting in 2010, the Secretary and Attorney General Holder have been putting in place many anti-fraud measures to stop people from stealing from Medicare. Starting back in 2010, and, and looking forward, they have already recouped over $10 billion in, in uh, money that they've been able to take this out of people's banks, bank accounts and put it back into Medicare so that Medicare is safe and strong and, and, and going to be here for the, for the future. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think people really need to understand that the Affordable Care Act is not just one or two things, but it's a lot of different measures mm -hmm. making Medicare a lot stronger. That is excellent information and, and excellent news. Dr. Fiebiger and Marguerite touched on this in her last remarks. One of the most important aspects of effective health care is the relationship between the doctor and the patient. Could you talk just a little bit about how the Affordable Care Act enhances that relationship? I'd be happy to. Very simply, the Affordable Care Act means that more people can come see us. The greatest barrier patients have had is the lack of insurance and or the inability to pay the high cost sharing required by private insurance. According to a recent poll by Kaiser Health, up to 30% of folks acknowledge skipping medications, not 
pursuing getting testing that they need or filling a prescription that they need primarily just because they can't afford it. The coverage for screening and contraception expanded for women in August of 2012 and this was a huge step forward. Now women can be guaranteed preventative care which has always been a struggle. They can get important screening tests which Marguerite was talking about such as mammograms, STD screening, pap smears, colon cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular and osteoporosis screening. They can get tests for HIV and HPV as well as the long list of immunizations that have all been proven to help keep us healthier. There's also been an expansion of, of evidence-based pregnancy care. On top of that, diet, alcohol, tobacco, domestic violence screening and counseling are also being provided now at levels that have never been accessible before, all of which contribute to a healthier, more functional population. And if states so choose, Medicaid coverage can be expanded by 2014 to cover up to 138 percent of the federal poverty level, which could be great news for roughly 15,000 women ages 18 to 64 here in North Dakota. Thank you, Dr. Fiebiger. Paul, you mentioned the state children's health insurance program and that it would remain in place until 2019. Perhaps you could talk just a little bit more about how that um, program interacts with the Affordable Care Act and, and what will happen as, as we go forward. Yes, <clears throat> the state children's health insurance program, otherwise known in North Dakota as Healthy Steps, covers children from low-income working families up to 160 percent of poverty. For a family of three, that's approximately $30,500. Um, you may wonder whether or not you qualify for this program. And if you want to check, you can Google Bridge to Benefits and answer 14 questions and find out whether or not you should be approaching your county social service agency to sign up for this program and many others. Uh, currently in North Dakota, we have about 10,000 children who do not have health care coverage in this state. And if the uh, legislature were to choose to expand the program, the federal government would provide over a 50% match to our dollars. That is excellent information as well. And I, I think that it's important to remember too that there are a variety of options and opportunities in this legislation to expand coverage, um, but there are going to be some legislative decisions that need to be made uh, in order to take advantage of that. Marguerite, one of the uh, important aspects of this legislation that is coming into play in 2014 are the health care exchanges. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about what those are and how they're going to work. Yes, Janice, and, and uh, the important thing is that we're starting to get ready right now because the health insurance exchange or health insurance marketplace is, is an, another term that you're going to hear, are going to have to be available and ready by October of 2013. Now what this is, is it's a place for individuals or small businesses to be able to purchase insurance at a much lower reasonable cost. Now uh, there will be two types, either a state-based ex exchange or a federally facilitated marketplace. And um, I believe that North Dakota may end up doing the federal facilitated exchange. And so what that means is that um, again, the, these are uh, opportunities that they are private insurance companies that individuals and small business can purchase. There will be a lot of different levels that you can go in and buy based on the amount of, of money that you want to pay toward that insurance product. And uh, every state in the country will have one. And so by 2014, people will be able to access that. There will be subsidies for families that make up to 400 percent of poverty. The idea is that we're trying to make sure that people are going to be able to afford this health insurance. Again, it makes so much sense to be sure that people can access health care early in their lives and, and maintain um, a, healthy, a healthy lifestyle. Dr. Fiebiger, it really does seem logical that we should be spending our resources and our energy um, on encouraging preventive care, encouraging people to be aware of, of health issues and to take action early rather than versus emergency care. Perhaps you could talk just a little bit about how the ACA helps us do that. 
Janice, you're so right. Um, as we've been talking about the fact that we currently have 50 million uninsured in the United States, as the Affordable Care Act rolls out and we anticipate providing coverage for at least 30 million of these people, 60 percent, they'll be able to access care in their doctor's office in a much earlier time frame in either a disease process or an injury. They'll have access to evidence-based screenings, immunizations, and these, this annual comprehensive risk assessment for Medicare patients, as well as comprehensive preventative and wellness services. So people may require less treatment. They may require less intervention, which overall will mean less cost. And they may have less disability, which means that they can continue to work and or get back to work earlier. Most importantly, they'll avoid the very expensive, inadequate, stopgap care provided by emergency rooms. And this cost savings will then go to defray the almost $1,000 a year that insured have paid in additional premiums needed to cover the emergency services that we currently provide for all. In short, our health status as a whole in this country should improve as more of us get timely and high quality care. I, I so agree with that and I also appreciated your comment earlier in the program where, we, where you mentioned the fact that we really do need to look at health care as um, as something that we're all entitled to and that we all need to participate in. There, there is definitely a responsibility for the medical system as well as each of us as patients or clients of that system to, to be part of, of making sure we are as healthy as possible. Paul, we've talked a little bit about the um, impact on children and I wonder if you could touch just uh, in a little more detail on the issue of, of caps on insurance and uh, the pre-existing condition limitations that are going away. Absolutely. Because of the Affordable Care Act, there are no lifetime caps on coverage and no refusals on pre-existing conditions for children. I'd like to introduce you to Allison, who is a young North Dakota girl diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder just before her second birthday. Allison had a $2 million lifetime cap on her insurance. Her infusions cost $309,000 per year. Approximately two years ago, she was only $300,000 from her lifetime cap. What would you do as a parent? In January 2011, Allison's parents were informed that she could stay on her parents' uh, insurance. Today, she continues on her life-saving medication because of the Affordable Care Act. That is really good news. Margaret, we just have a couple minutes left, and I wonder if you could touch on um, or reinforce perhaps some of the things that we've covered related to the health insurance exchanges beginning in 2014 and the fact that those are going to help people, particularly in that 50 to 64 year old age range, get and maintain coverage and then also how the Affordable Care Act impacts premium dollars that, that are uh, paid to insurance companies. Oh, sure, you know, that's a really important point because again, we look at the cost of insurance and what we were finding was that insurance companies were only spending sometimes only 40 cents of every premium dollar on health care. The new law states that insurance companies must spend at least 80 cents of every dollar on health care. And so what has happened um, is that if they don't do that, because a lot of times people say, well, how do, how do you know that that's really happening? We have been watching those things, and starting in August, over a billion dollars has been rebated back to customers who, uh, whose insurance companies were paying, were, were not spending at least that 80 cents of every dollar. So that's happening, and that's driving down the cost of, of health insurance. And one of the things I wanted to uh, make sure I mention is that members of Congress are also going to be purchasing their insurance on the health insurance exchange. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks said, I want the same insurance that Congress has. Well, now people will be able to do that. And like we said earlier, there will be tax credits for small business so that they'll be able to afford the insurance. We're, we're really trying to make it accessible for people 56 to 60, 65. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a group of folks who want to retire early, and but they're staying in their job because they want that insurance. They'll be able to purchase insurance now on the exchange. And if, if the state decides to do Medicaid expansion, that'll open up many opportunities for many more folks. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of you for this tremendously uh, rich conversation. And But I also want to point out that, indeed, in spite of the great information we've shared, this is only a, um, a capsule view of what the Affordable Care Act does. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it really is incumbent on all of us to be sure we understand the important aspects of this legislation. It is landmark legislation and will make a huge difference in the lives of, of um, citizens of our country and of our state going forward. I mentioned also that AARP is committed to an ongoing uh, provision of information about this legislation as it, as it develops. For more information, you can go to www.aarp.org slash health law education. And we'll also be going out around the state to provide information and presentations as this legislation continues to be implemented.